Well, good morning, Living Church. When you're living, it means you're growing, you're moving, and you're changing. And uh, this is a change we weren't anticipating, but it's part of the growth of the body of Christ and part of our stretching and challenging. And we, we have a new pastor coming, and we have a, well, he's not an old pastor, but a faithful pastor leaving. And uh, it's part of our life as a living church. So welcome this morning. We're in a series called Verbatim. We're looking at what does God's Word exactly say about very important topics? We've talked about many of them, and today we're talking about a topic that the Scripture doesn't mention very often. But if you listen, if you read carefully, you can see that it's woven in all in the, the motivational structure of our whole discipleship life. So the day, today the Word is ambition. What does the Word of God have to say about ambition? So if you have the ambition to stand with me this morning, I'd ask you to stand as we read God's Word, starting in Romans chapter 15 in verse 18. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there once I have enjoyed your company for a while. And then this glimpse at Paul's core motivation as he sends this dart of truth about himself. Colossians 1.28, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. This is God's word for us today. Thank you. You may be seated. Knowing what you know about our Heavenly Father, do you think our Heavenly Father is seeking to raise up lazy, listless, lackadaisical kids? Is the father seeking to raise up dissipated and distracted and sullen teenagers? Is the father wanting to raise up perpetual adolescent young adults or drone-like middle-agers or buffet-line seniors? (laughs) That one touched a nerve. Maybe I should say that one again. (laughs) What is God trying to produce? When we are brought into a a stance of faith and, and rest and confidence and peace, are we to be so humble that we no longer aspire to anything? That there's no longer a fire inside of us? Is our spiritual life, is our faith some kind of fabric softener that washes all the starch out of us? Well, I don't believe that's what the scripture is doing. And What we should ask, isn't God trying to seek to raise up ambitious disciples that have purpose and drive and creativity and take risks and they're determined to do things in this world while we have the opportunity? We need to detoxify the word ambition because so often it's been used in a negative way and so often we've seen it expressed in a negative way. And what would it take... And and what would become of me? Who would I become if I were able to clarify a godly, holy ambition for my life here and now? You know, my, my dad was not very successful at retiring. Maybe that's a genetic uh, thing. <laughs> and uh, after he finished with his his last church after he concluded that ministry, he went to work for World Vision, which was in Monrovia, Southern California. 
And he totally embraced their mission. He was all on fire for their mission. And my dad had always been a, a printer, a pressman throughout his life. He had gotten different, in different interim times, he had worked as a pressman. So he got a job in one of the largest printing uh, organizations in the world at that time. World Vision was producing magazines and brochures and all the stuff before the digital age, and they were just pumping it out. And so dad got an old Heidelberg press that was lying idle. He got it up and running and working, and he was just producing, producing, and producing. So one day his helper, a guy named Ray, who's, who's there to load the paper and to take away the printed material and box it up and send it and do all that stuff, Ray was in that day, and he was really not getting his job done. He was really kind of moping around and being lazy. And my dad said, Ray, what's going on with you? And Ray said, I'm bored. And my dad gave a phrase I'll never forget. He said, Ray, boredom is a luxury you can't afford. (laughs) And he meant that for two reasons. One is, we got to get this work done. And the other thing is, we're feeding a million children. You can't afford to be bored when we're about a great purpose. You need an ambition. And if you don't have an ambition, if you're not aware of your ambition, if you're not aware that you are born with an ambition and you're reborn to have a new and renewed ambition, then you'll just drift. You won't find God's purpose and joy in your life. But you have a God-implanted ambition to keep learning and stretching and growing and taking risks and discovering new insights and to ultimately bear fruit in your life. And that can be true no matter what your age, no matter what your health, no matter what your education, you can have a God-implanted and clarified ambition. So here are some synonyms to help you understand what this ambition means. Motivation, desire, eagerness, passion, and longing. And a godly ambition, a holy ambition, is that delicate balance between my passion and my humility to complete the assignment that God has given to me. We constantly come back to saying, what is driving me? Is it solely my passion? Is it my humility? How do those two things blend so that God's ambition My energy for God is lived out in this life. So boredom is a luxury we can't afford as a church. We recognize that the world is at risk. We recognize the things that are coming unraveled in our world. So let's unpack this in in four different stages. First of all, let's look at concealed ambition. The question here is, do I know what's driving me? Do you know what's driving you? I mean, really? Are you just getting pellets out of the feeder in the rat cage? (laughs) Are you just in the gerbil wheel? Do you know what's really driving you? Because something is driving you, and it's equally powerful in every single one of us. No matter what we do, no matter what we accomplish, we all have the same factory-installed engine in our life, and something is driving us. But the thing is, many times we don't recognize what that is. A couple of years ago, I read the autobiography of Andre Agassi. Now, there's, there's something wrong with an autobiography when you're only 40 years old, but nevertheless, Andre Agassi was, as you know, one of the greatest tennis players of all time. He won about 80% of his matches. He won 870 tennis matches. And here's what he wrote in his autobiography. I play tennis for a living, even though I hate tennis. I hate it with a dark and secret passion, and I always have. Now, to look at Andre Agassi, you'd think, man, that guy must love the game. He must love honing his skill. He must love coming up with a new shot. He must love the fame and the money and the, the fortune that he's made. But down beneath it, he realizes after 20 years on the pro circuit, in the middle of his life, I hated every single minute. So what drove him? What 
was it that was driving him? It was the fear of the shame and the abuse of his father if he lost. I call those deficit motivators. When you're driven by fear or anger or guilt, it's like drinking salt water. It looks like it will quench your thirst, but actually it's drying you out on the inside. And when you're motivated by guilt or fear or anger, what's happening is you're, you're driven. You move. You can do amazing things, but it's going to dry you out sooner or later. It's not going to work. It's not going to last. So the question is, do you know what's driving you? Well, let's go back to the beginning because this drive is a good thing, at least in its origin. In Genesis 1.27, it says this, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and and wait for it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Theologically, we call this the image of God. It's part of the image of God is to have dominion. We all have the same size engine inside of us that's longing to have dominion. It's the created order. It's the hard wiring of the universe. But the problem is, as we know, that this this was sabotaged by the fall, and it became this desire for dominion became muddied and muddled with toil and struggle and a lot less reward than what we'd love to have. But the Creator's image still gurgles in every single one of us. Male and female, young and old, healthy and sick, we all have this image that bubbles up inside us and pushes us and pulls us. But often we're not very discerning. What what part of my family history is really driving me? What fear is really behind my overweening work and perfectionism? Am I so afraid that somebody's going to see that I'm not omnicompetent and in some areas I have some gaps and inadequacies? Am I so fearful of that that I just can't stop? I can't rest. Am I governed by my mother's voice, my father's expectations? Am I fearing failure or imperfection? Have I always desired to be desired? to be beautiful. I want to be a winner. I want to be rich. I want to be important. I I want power. And here's one true thing. Whatever it is that you may identify that's been motivating you or or giving you ambition, this this thing we know, we pursue what we prize. Whatever we value, we go after. And there's some polarities in Scripture that talk about this concealed ambition. On the one hand, you have the zealot, and Saul, before he became the Apostle Paul, is a a case study in this, that he was a zealot. He was the Sanhedrin's hitman. He, He was like the secret police, and he was passionate, and he was rigid. You're either with me or you're against me. You're for me or or against me. You are either uh, on this side or that side. And Paul was out to stamp out anyone who was opposed to his party's agenda. And we would call him aggressively fanatical about one single thing. So that's one picture in Scripture of the, the zealot who's lost all sense of balance. On the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum is the sluggard that we find in the book of Proverbs. You know, the lazy bones, the, the wastrel. The, the sluggard is one who's continually preparing and always planning for new adventures in basic inactivity. We would call it leisure. And so this is buried ambition. Paul or Saul had a blind ambition, but the sluggard has a buried ambition and he's aggressively Passive. But here's the point. Just as motivated. Just as ambitious to accomplish what he or she wants as the person who's performing. 
Because there's no such thing as unmotivated behavior. And dominion may be applied to fanatical, ruthless, even violent things that we see on the outward side, or ambition can be applied to those quiet fears and guilt that ambitiously keep us hidden and inactive. There's no such thing as unmotivated behavior. What you do, what you don't do, has ambition behind it. And your challenge this morning may be sticking on this first point, to go from here and seek God. And say, Lord, what is it that's, why am I chasing this? What is my ambition? What's the voice I'm hearing? Why can't I stop? Why can't I start? There's a concealed ambition in all of us, and God is about to clarify all those things for us. So you may need to look deeply and take that challenge this morning and ongoing into this week. Because we also have a corrupted ambition. And the question about this one is, what direction is my ambition taking me? The very first corrupted ambition was evidenced by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They said, we should be able to know good and evil. We should be able to eat of any tree that we want. We should be able to do this. And they abandoned God and broke his covenant with them. And now in every direction that we look, it's not hard to find corrupted ambition. An unchecked profit motive brings corruption. A voracious Motive for power brings corruption. Jealous competitiveness to win every time brings corruption. An obsession with control and controlling people brings corruption. A fearful motivation to avoid discomfort or to avoid all conflict brings corruption. A craven desire for fame and notoriety is everywhere from Facebook to Hollywood corrupt. Listen to James chapter 3, because there is no new psychology. It's already been revealed in Scripture. James chapter 3, verse 13. It says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Selfish ambition comes with baggage. And here are some of the carry-ons. Bitter jealousy, boasting, falsehood. It's demonic. It brings disorder. And Paul sums it up by saying every vile practice. Paul writes also that in 2 Timothy 4, he says, Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. You see, Demas stated that his motivation was to preach the gospel with Paul, but any ambition can be corrupted when what we say is not actually what we're pursuing. And any commitment can be left behind when we have a a stated motive, but the real motivation of the heart is something else. And the Bible calls this the flesh or worldliness or the sinful desires of the world, the pursuing after things that we can see. It's basically idolatry. And let's face it, shall we? I mean, most of the emblems and symbols of success in our world, most of the end products of ambition in our culture, the success, the fame, the the victory stands, the red carpet, the corner office, most, not all, but most are signs of corrupted, selfish ambition. Because ambition sours like milk. It looks good, but it stinks. So there's a corrupted ambition. But let's get to something happier, shall we? (laughs) Let's talk about converted ambition because that's where we're headed. That's what we want. And here's the question. What can I pursue with all my heart? 
What can, I, what can I give myself to and not look in the rear view mirror five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road and not regret, not feel like I've wasted it? I have an 11-year-old granddaughter who's singing in a musical today and it's so much fun to watch childlike enthusiasm. She probably was awake at five this morning. You know, eager, just so eager. And it's just so infectious to see someone who's just wholehearted and gives her whole heart to something. And don't we all want that? Lord, give me something I can just give my, all of my passions to and not look back in any kind of regret and depend on you to supply the energy to do that. Well, you know what you're looking for? You're looking for glory. You're a glory pursuer. Listen to what Paul David Tripp says about this. Admit it, you're a glory junkie. That's why you like the 360 degree between the legs slam dunk or that amazing hand beaded formal gown or the seven layer triple chocolate mousse. It's why you're attracted to the hugeness of a mountain range or the multi-hued splendor of the sunset. You were hardwired by your creator for a glory orientation. It is inescapable. It's in your genes. Glory is what grabs us. Glory is why we go to the Grand Canyon and just stand there in, in speechless awe. Glory is what we want to see by the work of our hands, that somehow we've contributed to something that lasts, that's glorious. But the unfortunate thing is when this desire for glory is misdirected, it just leads us down blind alleys and into cul-de-sacs and into dark labyrinths of regret. It says in Romans chapter 1 that humanity exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images that look like us, and it ruined all of humanity. In Ecclesiastes, it talks about a hell-bent pursuit to explore every means of getting glory for oneself through, through sex and fame and, and riches, and the story is that the person ends up broken and empty and alone. But the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, tells the story of the most perfect, ambitious man. He knew exactly why he came. And in John 17, he says, I came to glorify the Father. And it was that clear ambition, it was the clarity of that ambition that helped Jesus complete his, his ministry and finish the mission that God sent him on to give glory to God. And it was for the joy of that that even endured the cross and its shame to give salvation to us. So those of us who know Jesus know that the gospel has come to save us, to rescue us from death, to take away our small ambitions and to implant in us a passion that says, I was reborn for this. No matter what my family was like, no matter what my history was like, no matter my education or my health or my strength or my weakness, I was reborn for one thing, to bring glory to God. And a very important issue here is that I was that I no longer live for approval, but from approval. In other words, the gospel says you don't have to stir yourself up and prove yourself to be adequate. You don't have to please God in that way. But Jesus came and said, I want to invite you into my family totally by grace. And now I call you son. I call you daughter. You are an heir and a co-heir with my son, Jesus Christ. You have an inheritance waiting for you, and you have a mission. You have an ambition that I will supply the energy for you to do so that at the end of your life, you can say, Lord, I've lived my life for you. And you're secure. So we, we do this from approval, not trying to seek his approval, but from his approval. It's a whole new identity, a whole new fullness, a whole new motivation. And watch what happens to an obsessive fanatic, a ruthlessly ambitious man headed in the wrong direction when you read about the life of Paul. Because here's a man who was climbing a ladder of success, and it was leaning against the wrong wall. 
And instead of giving his life to that, God called him and gave him a whole new purpose in life. He became totally sold out to give glory to God. So look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. Paul says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And a prayer that we could all begin our day with, and I'm sure the Apostle Paul knew this prayer in Psalm 115, verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. So why are we here? Why are we given new life in Christ? It's to give glory to God, and that's what we want the most. But that's kind of ethereal and high-minded. So how do we break that down? Well, let me give you three instances in the life of Paul where he specifically uses this word ambition. Three times he uses the word, and the first one is, he says, I want to preach the gospel. My ambition is to preach the gospel. And he says in, in Romans chapter 15, verse 22, he says, for this reason, this is the reason why I've so often been hindered from coming to you, but now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, that's kind of an overstatement, but anyway, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. What was the reason that Paul hadn't come to them yet? It was, it, was he a bad planner? Was, did, did, he, did, he, uh, uh, did he lie to them? Did he mislead them? No, he's saying, I've often been hindered. Why? Because of his ambition and his ambition to preach the gospel. Paul's specific ambition was to preach to those who hadn't yet heard the gospel. And you may not be a preacher. You might not be a cross-cultural missionary. You, you, might think, you might think that what the Word is talking about is what I'm doing here, that you need to be a preacher, and that, that is a fear worse than death itself. And it should be. I still fear that. <laughs> We have the idea that, that preaching means standing in front of large crowds and proclaiming, but that's not what it means. What it means is simply telling. It means proclaiming. It means living out, preparing the context, being an example, telling your story, being ready to testify of what Jesus has done for you. And Paul says, my ambition is to preach the gospel. And that's our ambition. Whether you're a mom raising Preschoolers, whether you're a dad hard at work or an architect or an IT expert, maybe you're in sales or you're a soccer player, you're a teacher, you're a caregiver, you're a public servant, you're a neighbor, whatever it is, that's why we're the living church out there is to preach the gospel. And it's not usually with a bullhorn or a platform. It's sowing the seed of light and salt and yeast and it's able to see, sow that seed so when the opportunity comes along, we can simply point and verbalize and tell people about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So how do you glorify God? What is your ambition as a living saint in the living church? It's to preach the gospel. Secondly, Paul uses this word, ambition, when he says, I want to please him. In 2 Corinthians 5, 9, he says, for whether we are at home, meaning on earth, or away, meaning in heaven, we make it our aim. Here's this specific word. We make it our aim, our ambition, to please him. Now, again, let me remind you, this is not pleasing him for approval. It's pleasing him from approval. You know, it's, it's a delight to, to, to see the pleasure on the face of your music teacher when you play the piano well, just to see the product of what has happened. It's a joy for us to, to watch the delight in the face of a new homeowner when they walk into a home that maybe we built for them. It's a joy to see pleasure when we've given a gift that's really meaningful. It's that kind of pleasing that we're talking about here, to please him. And there is an infinite variety of scenarios in life in which we can please him. And they're not all pleasant for us. A lot of Paul's circumstances were not pleasant for him. He had all kinds of struggles 
He was earning his living as he did his mission by making tents. He, he hiked, he walked, he was shipwrecked. He was stoned and beaten and thrown out of cities. He spent time in jail. He met with a lot of disappointment and redirection of his goals. But you know, you're waiting and you're struggling and your discovering of God's will in your life may be God's backhoe that's excavating what your true ambition really is. Sometimes our disappointments and hardships really get the overburden off and we really see the bedrock of our commitment to Christ. So we're pleasing him because we want to see the pleasure on his face that his son or his daughter is obedient and following him. And the third place that Paul talks about this word ambition specifically is to live quietly, to live quietly, to preach the gospel, to please him, to live quietly. Now that sounds like a contradiction, except here's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.10. Aspire, that's the word ambition. Be ambitious to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your own hands. Now this can't possibly mean some kind of mousy isolation from the world. It can't possibly mean some kind of oblivious denial of the problems of the world or our extended families or our economies or all of that. What Paul is talking about here in living quietly is finding that inner center where you come to rest at the end of every day, where you find the peace of God over your soul so that you have the energy to go and do the mission and the ambition that God has given to you. I love the one verse of this song, Be still, my soul, the Lord is on my side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Maybe you're raising young children, and you're trying to instill in them an honor for their parents and an honor for God. And you wonder, is this making any progress? Are, are we getting any place? Because it seems like endless repetition of the same lessons. But isn't this line comforting? Leave to thy God to order and provide. Whatever your endeavors are, whatever your ambition, wherever it takes you, you're not here to change the world. You're here with the calling of Jesus on your life and the specific ambition he's giving you today. And you don't have to chase every ambulance. You don't have to fetch every stick that the media throws out there. You don't have to respond to every emergency or tragedy as hard as that is. Don't try to be great. Determine to be ambitious for Christ, to be faithful and obedient to him. Well, finally... Sometimes we have a concealed ambition. We have a corrupted ambition from our forebears. We have a converted ambition that wants to serve and glorify God. And finally, we have a concentrated ambition. And the question here is, how does focused ambition provide clarity? How does the focused ambition that God will give to you individually? You're not the Apostle Paul. You're not a pastor in this church. You're not a cross-cultural missionary you haven't had a biblical education. Well, how is God going to clarify your specific ambition for him? In Romans 15, it says that Paul was prevented from coming to them because, and it wasn't bad planning, it was because of his ambition. He said, I, I couldn't come to you because I know what God has called me to do, and now I've seen that the gospel has gone from Jerusalem to Illyricum, which is the Dalmatian coast of Croatia and Albania today. He said, now that I've seen that that's gone through the missionaries with the, with the word of God, now my ambition says I need to go to Spain and on my way, I'm gonna stop and meet with you in Rome. Paul was ambitious, but he had a greater yes that helped him say no to a thousand interruptions and distractions. This is where a clarified ambition can help us in our lives. Uh, when I was in junior high, 
in Golden, Colorado, we had in our class a young man who was a violin prodigy. His name was Eugene Fodor, and uh, he won every contest we could ever remember in our school. And, uh, but he, you know, just kind of a regular guy. He was in our class, but, but when we went to gym class, uh, he, was, he was forbidden uh, by his father from playing volleyball because he couldn't hurt his fingers. And uh, we, we did not understand that, and we, we gave him so much grief. Oh, Eugene, you can't play, you can't play volleyball. You've got to protect your little delicate fingers. You know? Or, you know how ruthless junior high boys are. We mocked him and he, as he stood in the corner and watched us play volleyball. <laughs> little did we know that in a couple of years, he was going to play for presidents and with the Boston Philharmonic and with the Denver Symphony. And while we're, we're still young jerks snapping towels in the locker room <laughs> and, and popping pimples, you know, he's off on this journey that he's doing because he had a calling on his life. He had a talent in his life. And his greater yes enabled him to say no the things that would have been harmful to him or distracting to what God has called him to do. Just a minor example out of my life for the last 45 years. The rhythm of my week has usually been I've been so busy with people and meetings and strategies and everything else and I've studied and all that, but I've always tried to keep Saturday mornings as my final preparation time. And so I get up early and I try to isolate myself. I don't know anything that's going on in the culture on Saturday mornings. You also know that I like to ride bikes and uh, get exercise, especially in the warm summer days. And I had a neighbor who used to go on a group bike ride every Saturday morning at 7. And he would see me in my study, and he would ride circles in the street out in front of my house, you know, tempting me to come. And I, I went to go, I got to go a couple of times, just a couple of times out of all these years. But he was always circling, going, come on, come on. Finally, I would just wave him off, wave him off. Well, just, just a little example. You see, my ambition, as imperfectly as it gets fulfilled, is to, to contribute somehow by God's grace to, to building a healthy church. And, and that depends on the Word of God. And that depends on my own rhythm of the week. Having some things I have to say yes to, I want to say yes to, because they have a greater reward. And therefore, I say no to a thousand distractions. And most people will never know the things you say no to when you recognize I have a greater yes in my life. I have a concentrated vision and there's something in my life that, about this ambition that helps me keep moving forward, whether you're teaching third grade boys on a Wednesday night or whether you're building a company, whatever it is that you're doing, that God gives you this clarified vision. And maybe even today, you need to pull some weeds in your garden. And say, you know, I need to clarify, this is what I'm here for. This is the season of my life. And I have a vision for God, an ambition for God, that I want to do this well for this season. And therefore, it clarifies and helps me say no to a thousand distractions. Well, you can't do it all. And maybe this is a good time to insert a recommendation for the book Margin by Richard Swenson. That you can't respond to every tragedy, you can't respond to every opportunity, even when it's good. You're not called to do that, and that's the beauty of the body of Christ. And I'm perpetually amazed at how God has distributed the gifts of the body of Christ. So if your gift is to knit hats for the homeless, and you have that skill and that gift, do it with an ambition to bring glory to Jesus. If your ambition is to employ 100 people and make a great product and fulfill livelihoods for those people, then do it with an ambition for Christ. If if you build custom machinery and it's wonderful looking stuff and you're captivated by it, well, do it with an ambition for Christ. Maybe you're an HR or you're a coach or you drive a bus or you tutor math or you're raising preschoolers or you're roofing or you're a caregiver or maybe you're in recovery. There is no condition under which we cannot have an ambition for Christ to do what he asks us to do on a daily basis. 
And Paul says, I have an ambition to preach. I have an ambition to please him. I have an ambition to live quietly at the center with him. And this is why I love thinking about all of you deploying on a Monday morning the living church out there with an, a holy ambition for Jesus to share his name. So Paul says in Colossians 1.29, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. I'm continually amazed at the engine that God gives to his people. People doing things that I couldn't do for 10 minutes. And maybe I'm doing something that they couldn't do for 10 minutes. But God gives you the ambition. God gives you the gifting. And God has the calling on your life. And these natural skills can turn into a holy ambition and a collective godly ambition by the living church to proclaim his name with great vigor, purpose, and love to the world. Because living church, boredom is a luxury we can't afford. God has given us a holy ambition. and God wants to raise up ambitious disciples, and you are one. Let's pray about this. Will you join me? Father, thank you for this opportunity today, for being challenged by your word. And I pray, Lord, that today, even as many of us examine how to clarify our ambition, how to declutter it from distractions or from sin. Lord, as we perhaps discover where our ambition has been concealed, we weren't really aware of what we were chasing, that you'd replace that lostness with a clarity to help us run without regret toward you. Thank you, Lord, for each person here today, and I pray for your ambition to be born in us and to live in us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. It's a joy to worship with you this morning, to have you here with us, and we want you to know it's, it's never done. If you want to pray with someone, perhaps something has been triggered in your own mind and heart, and you'd like to pray with someone, we'll have prayer teams down front here, or you can go across over to the care section across the hall in the commons and uh, pray with someone there. We would love to know that, and you also can go to our website on the Connect card and mention prayer requests to us because we, we want the living body of Christ to know that, that you have a resource in the, in the praying body. But what a joy to worship together, and thank you for coming, and God bless you.